the feet of Jesus, that we would get lost in His presence together as we worship together. Would you stand with us? We're going to sing. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God.
sing a new song now and it's called Hope of the Ages. One of the lines of this song says, His word is the answer. It will never be tainted. It will never be broken. See, the truth is that Jesus died, Jesus is risen, and Jesus is coming back. And that is true for all generations. It's the hope of the ages. So as we sing that today, let's remember how real that is how true that is and proclaim that truth. The gospel of Jesus is the hope of the ages burning brighter and brighter and standing forever the church he is building nothing can stop it it's a city that's shining, a light in the darkness. Nothing can stop it. Though Christ was dead, now sure. 
Father. We thank you, Lord. We bless your name today. We thank you, Lord, that you are faithful. And we thank you, Lord, that you are trustworthy. There are two qualities and characteristics that are in you as our God. And we declare them today. We thank you for your faithfulness, Lord, that you know our story, that you walk with us. And you're a God who can be trusted. Lord, you hold our future. And it is through Jesus, your work on the cross, your great sacrifice for all humankind, your death and your resurrection, that we can live in that resurrected power. Thank you for that freedom, that life. Thank you, Lord, for the peace, the redemption that we have only through you. So we bless your name today. We worship you today and we love you. We say that we love you. As we're in this time of worship, I just uh, ask you to take your seat and grab the little card that's on your seat. If you can grab that while we stay in this time of worship. If you're online, what we're going to be doing now is we're looking at wanting to explore what are the things that God has been saying to us during our time of prayer and fasting. We're coming uh, on the last day of our prayer and fasting today, two weeks of intentionally seeking the Lord, of giving things up and spending time with Him. And we want to know what God's been saying. What is it that He's been depositing into our community? And I want you to, to look at this card and it just says, what is God saying? And it might be that uh, you don't use pen and paper anymore and that's okay. You might want to get your phone out and create a new thread. You might have already done this. What is God saying? Prayer and fasting, 2022. And I want you to write down the things that God has been impressing upon your heart. They might be very personal things. They might be things for us as a community of faith. But what is it that God has been saying? Take some time now to write down on this card or to write a new note on your phone and write down the things that over these last two weeks God has been saying to you as an act of worship today. If you're online, I want you to drop it into the chat. I want you to drop into the chat what God is saying, what God has been saying. Drop it into the chat. So just take a moment now. As we're in this time of worship, take a moment to write down the things that God has been saying. If you need a pen, just pop your hand up and one of the team will put that into your hands. What has God been saying? I'm just going to give you a moment. Clove used to be a people of, of faith who experienced God. We were faith filled and spirit led. We want to be open to the things that God is speaking by faith into us as a community. And a time of prayer and fasting is a time, particularly as lead pastor, where I listen to what is God saying to us as a community as well. We're going to go into a time of worship. We're going to we're going to continue to sing uh, to the Lord. But if the Lord's deposited a word into you over these last two weeks that you believe is to be shared uh, with the church, if you're in the room, Michelle's going to be down one side and Dubsy's going to be down on the other. And I want to invite you to come and speak to them and share with them that word. If you're online, drop it into the chat so that we can know what God is saying. Not every word is for it is for uh, the public, but there might be something that God has deposited into you for us at this time in this season. I want to give you that invitation to come down and speak to Michelle or speak to Dubs. But for the rest of us, let's stand and let's continue to worship the Lord.
worship you, Lord. We thank you for how we get lost in you. And we thank you, Lord, for where you take us when we surrender ourselves before you. If God's placed a, a word on your heart for us as a community of faith during this time of prayer and fasting, then come down and speak with Dubs, speak with Michelle now. Uh, drop it in the chat if you're online. But Elijah, what's the Lord been saying? Um, I actually came across a awesome Bible verse um, I'd really love to share with you all. It's um, Romans 8, verse 37 uh, to 39. Um, and it says, Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Um, yeah, that's really been sticking with me um, this um, last couple of weeks. Um, it's really fueled me with... Uh, I'm more than a conqueror because of the one that loved me before. And I really want to encourage all of you that you guys are all conquerors because God loved you first. He sent His Son um, to die for you on the cross. And yeah, that is something we just really need to celebrate. So, yeah. Well, let's celebrate, church. Let's put our hands together. Thank you, Lord. It's wonderful. Thank you, Elijah, for sharing together with us today. Uh, there's some... Um, people that have dropped in online uh, that feel like God is uh, saying that He's our provider, uh, that we need to keep trusting in Him as we move forward, that it's important that we work to His timelines and not our own, that restoration is uh, from our relationship with God as we spend time in prayer and worship and waiting on Him, as we reorganize our priorities and make time and space for Him. Amen. Let's put our hands together. Thank those online that have been sharing. It's wonderful. It's not too late. God's placed a word on your heart for us coming out of our prayer and season, our prayer and fasting season. Really important moments as a church family as we wait and we listen to the things that He has uh, for us. Andrew, you want to come share with us? study um, I've come across just the fact that the Bible was portrayed it portrays unity as the highest form of Christian relationships and transcends um, all our natural understanding of love is love transcends all of our differences and um, opinions and and our thoughts and uh, yeah it's the highest form of Christian relationships wonderful thank you let's Put our hands together. Let's thank God for the unity that He desires to have uh, with us. Roger. What's the Lord been saying? Oh, well, the Lord's hit me between the eyes over and over again. And He's given me John 14, uh, 15 through to 23. And that covers the, uh, the area of if we truly love Him, we will obey His commands. And that's like part of ourself that indicates our salvation is actually conditional, that we actually need to beaver away and uh, obey his commands. Yeah. That's great. Thanks, Roger. Let's put our hands together. I've got a real sense. You can grab your seat if you want. I've got a real sense as, uh, as we have been in this time of prayer and fasting, the, the word that keeps coming back to me time and time again is that the Lord wants to do a deep work. He wants to do a deep work in us this year. And uh, for some, it, it might be a hard year as we engage in the process of restoration. And what does it mean to be restored unto God and restored in our relationships, restored uh, to the earth in which we live and into the world in which we operate? And you just feel like the Lord keeps saying to me, a deep work, a deep work. I'm going to keep doing a deep work in you. It's not something that is like a microwave meal, you know, it just happens in a, you know, 30 seconds sort of thing. It's a deeper work that he was wanting to do. And he led me to Psalm 51, where he says, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. 
restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. That's what I sense the Lord is wanting to do in us as a community. This year is going to be a year of deep work where he tends to some things maybe in our heart and in our soul that maybe we haven't for some time. It's not lost on me that this is Psalm 51. The Psalm written by David after he committed adultery with Bathsheba. A Psalm of confession and repentance. So my encouragement and my ask as your lead pastor is to attend to the things that the Lord is bringing into your life. Maybe those annoying things that just keep coming back to mind and heart that you wish didn't, but he's wanting to do a deeper work. He's wanting to take you on a journey of becoming more like Jesus. That sanctifying work in and through your life. And his heart for us is that he'd create in us a pure heart. And he'll be with us as we keep trusting him, as we keep walking with him. He's the faithful one. We walk in his time and not ours. So let's pray together. Lord, we want to thank you so much for your love. We thank you, Lord, that you are a God who speaks today. Thank you so much that you have plans and purposes for us, Lord, and that your heart's desire is to go deeper with us. So we bring ourselves to you now. And we say, Lord, our posture to to you is yes. Out of a love and a trust in you, our posture to you is yes. Keep allowing us to obey your commands, to trust you more, to to work within your time frames, uh, to be more than conquerors because of your love and sacrifice for us. And keep doing that deep work, I pray. Keep doing that deep work. Cultivate deep roots in our life. We love you, Lord, and we bless your name. God's people said, amen. Well, it's wonderful to be in church today. We have a couple of special visitors uh, with us as well. We have Scott Pilgrim, who's going to be bringing the word to us. And Scott is the executive director of Baptist Mission Australia, which used to be uh, Global Interaction. And we also have uh, Lysa, uh, who's the state director, who's freshly minted, by the way, being inducted today at one o'clock at Enfield Baptist Church. So can you guys stand up and can we welcome them with us today? Thank you. So good. If it's your first time here in the room, just out the doors and across the foyer uh, is uh, our next steps. And it's a place where you can go if you've got any questions about anything in the life of the church. And we'd love to get to know you uh, a little bit more. If you're online, then please uh, go to uh, chloe.com.au and just uh, fill in the connect card uh, there. And we'd love to get to know you a little bit more as well. Just a few things happening in the life of the church. Uh, We have Discovering Clovey next week. So if you've been coming into uh, Clovey over the last little while, we had around 25 people at our meet and greet a couple of weeks ago, which is wonderful. Sadly, Michelle and I were out with COVID, so I I didn't get to actually meet you, which, which, you know, I've met some of you, but not all. And uh, and the next steps really is to go into what we call Discovering Clovey. and, And that's where you can learn a little bit more about the life of the church and how Baptist churches run and just some different things like that, answer any questions you might have around taking next steps into community here. We also have Easter coming up. And last week we gave you the, uh, an Easter invitation. You can get them from the website as well. But the question is, who are you inviting? Uh, the card that we gave you last week isn't uh, an information card, it's an invitation. Uh, it's an invitation that you can put in the hands of someone at work, in your street, in your family. Who are you inviting along to Easter? And you can see uh, the details there as well. And we have an opportunity this uh, uh, time, um, this season, to be engaging uh, with the Valiant Man course uh, for all the men out there. And this is a really important uh, part of uh, our one, our one's discipleship around um, pursuing sexual purity. And Lee uh, has got a few more things to say. So if you can turn your attention to the screen, that'd be great. Thanks. Hi, Clovey. Let's acknowledge together that every person battles with sexual purity especially in these days where it's just getting harder and harder. That's why at Clovey, every year or two, we offer a course called Valiant Man. Valiant Man 
helps men to grapple with the issues of sexual discipleship and sexual purity and really improves their relationships. Valiant Man deals with a whole range of different topics related to sexual discipleship, including pornography and its addictive nature and how to overcome that. One of the big challenges that men face when considering attending the course is talking to their wives and partners. Women, can I encourage you that when men have the courage to talk to you about this, that it's a great step forward and that it's really good, even though you might feel some anxiety and have a whole lot of questions, to hold those questions back and just encourage your bloke to go. I'll be facilitating the course with Daryl Rogers, who has run many, many Valiant Man courses in his time and has seen great results with the men who have attended in terms of their lives and their relationships. Daryl and I will be out in the foyer and would love to talk to you about Valiant Man. However, you can also just look us up during the week and we'd be happy to chat to you. You can register confidentially online using the Connect page on the Clovey website. Great. I'd love to commend that course uh, to you if you haven't uh, done that uh, course. I, I did it a number of years ago and it's a, a very important uh, course if you haven't engaged in that. I want to thank those that call Clovey home and give financially uh, week in, week out into the life and the mission uh, here at Clovey. And you can see that there's three ways to give up on the screens behind me. It's a pleasure to have uh, you with us, Scott, and he's, Scott's about to bring uh, the word. It's uh, a bit ironic, isn't it, that the first two weeks of our Nehemiah series, you had myself and Michelle who uh, videoed in from home, and we have an inter interstate guest speaker uh, who's going to be here in person, uh, which is wonderful. Now, Scott, many of you might know Scott because he's preached here a couple of times before, but he has preached uh, via the video because of lockdown and different things like that. So you're a familiar face uh, to us and we're really grateful that you can be here in person. Scott and I first uh, got to know each other on a Baptist World Aid trip uh, to Kenya. And um, when we arrived in Kenya, there was a few pastors on the trip that all of a sudden had travel sickness and they needed to sit up the front of the bus. So Scott and I ended up at the back of the bus. And if you've ever been to Kenya and you've been uh, on a road in Kenya, there's many potholes and, 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 uh, and there's lots of, uh, uh, lots of things to dodge on the roads. And we were sitting at the back of the bus and, uh, and the drivers, you know, they like a little bit of speed. And uh, Scott and I were just bumping our way through uh, Nairobi and the, and, and the country surrounds. And then they had these, um, remember these vans that had the little thing in the roof that they'd pop up, little sunroof, and, and the guys, oh, we need a bit of air up the front, you know, we're feeling a bit travel sick, and Scott and I are up the back of the bus, and, uh, and all of a sudden you lift this thing in the roof, and then we were just in a wind tunnel, <laughs> so we got all the, all the wind and all the red dirt and everything that came with that, but it forged a friendship, didn't it? You know, it was, it was good, and we had some fun along the way. And I'm uh, really, uh, really uh, glad that you can be with us today, Scott. So why don't we put our hands together for Scott. He's going to come up. So let's welcome him. And he's going to come and speak just after we show you a little bit about Baptist Mission Australia. So let's turn to the screens. Who is Baptist Mission Australia? We're Jesus followers, good news sharers, people lovers. We're goers, risk takers, adventurers, and senders. We're the intercultural workers on the ground. And the people partnering with them in churches across the nation. We're committed to coming alongside and meeting people where they are. We're for relationships, building bridges, and finding common ground. We're about word and deed. We're about inviting people to meet Jesus and allow them to see and follow him in ways that make sense to them, in their own distinctive ways. We're for mission here and over there. Why? Because Australian Baptists are a mission people. Who is Baptist Mission Australia? We're storytellers. We're God's storytellers. We are 140 years of faith stories. We're prayers and givers. Encouragers and doers. We're, We're partners. partners. We're disciples committed to disciple making. We are for asking questions, for making mistakes and for trying again. We're building on an inspiring past and investing in the next generations. We're about new ideas, old truth, and a hope that never changes. We're about speaking in their language and learning their ways in order to communicate the way in a way that makes sense to them. We're for taking time and standing with locals so their communities can be better places. 
where for moving outside our comfort zones and even changing time zones. Who is Baptist Mission Australia? We're you, we're her, we're him, we're them. We are from many places and different cultures. We're all of us working together, embracing God's gracious invitation to mission. Listeners, learners, alongside us, ordinary people with the mission of God in our hands. Simply, we're the intercultural mission of the Australian Baptist movement. And that's why we've changed our name from Global Interaction to Baptist Mission Australia. And we invite you to join us, to pray, to give, to go, to come alongside. Thank you for the invitation to be with you today. Great to be here in person in Adelaide, uh, Australia's most livable city, Adelaide. I come from Melbourne that once was the most livable city in Australia. But uh, thank you for the invitation, particularly to Mike and uh, Michelle. Um, can I just encourage you, I move around churches across the nation and I'm, uh, I'm struck by the fact that uh, where we see mission and health and growth, be that local and global, uh, we see really great, godly, strong, courageous leadership. And cherish that leadership you have here with uh, Mike and Michelle at, uh, at Clovercrest. And great to have Lysa with us. Uh, we're off to Enfield. Uh, wherever Enfield is. We're going to get there by one o'clock this afternoon for Liza's commissioning. And we're also commissioning a new national young adults worker uh, with our organisation at Baptist Mission Australia, Rachel, who's also Adelaide-based. So uh, it's really, uh, really great to be here today. Can I pray as we uh, come to God's word this morning? Father, we want to take up those words that Mike has already spoken today. We want to invite you to go deeper into our lives today. We want to be people of faith and courage who dare open up our lives and our hearts and our minds afresh to you, that you might do something new in us today. That you are the God of restoration, the God of renewal. And so we pray, come Holy Spirit, move in our lives today as we open your word in Jesus' name. Amen. My kids are absolutely obsessed with watching home improvement and home renovation programs. When I was a kid, I never watched home renovation programs, but they're on all the time, you know. The Block, My House Rules, Reno, Inc., Flip It, Flip That, Flip This, Flip Everything, you know. And my kids seem to find a show on all the time about home improvement. Maybe one of the reasons I don't like those programs is because I am not a handyman. If I pick up a hammer in my house, the rest of the family says, Dad, put the hammer down. My kids often say, we'd like to see you and mum go on the block because, dad, what would happen is mum would walk out and there'd be this dramatic scene on national television. You know, Megan would be there knocking the walls down and I'd feel really at home because I'd much prefer to be at Freedom, buying the pillows and kind of styling. But whether you're here in the auditorium today or watching online, uh, we celebrate the fact that that our God is a a restoration God. Our God is in the business of restoration. And I read an article recently that said, well, why are we so fascinated with home improvement programs? And this author suggested three things, and they really were challenging. The first is research shows that whenever there is a kind of global or national crisis event, we kind of turn inward. During the pandemic, Bunnings has done a great business. You know, even in Melbourne, in the midst of lockdown, you couldn't get a sausage sandwich, but you could click and collect at Bunnings. And the warehouse trade boomed. Second thing this author says is that innately within us, inside each one of us, deep down, we all want change and renovation in our lives. If I were to sit at the door today with a clipboard as you came in and said, would you like something inside your heart and soul and life to change today? I'm sure we all would have said yes. 
the courage is, do we desire that God would bring that change into my life and yours? And the third thing this author said, which really was the ouch moment for me, is it's so much easier for a person like me to change my external world. You asked my family during lockdown in Melbourne, I changed the furniture so many times. I've changed my office already a few times. People who know me know that I like to change things around. But you know, it's so much easier for me to move furniture than to allow God to move deep into my heart and change things that need changing. And so I step back from that. I remind myself that our God is a restoring God. Our God is a renewing God. Our God is in the restoration business. And I got up this morning, thanks to the Stevens hospitality, and you know, there I was in the bathroom. I look in the mirror, and despite what I see, I remind myself that I am a work in progress. That's who you are today. God is not finished with you yet. God is not finished with you yet. You might be here in the auditorium or watching online. You think, well, this is it. God is the God of new things, the God of restoration, the God of renewal, the God who wants to bring change into our lives. Because you've been celebrating this great book. You've been working your way through Nehemiah. And I checked out the first couple of messages online. And there's been some great stuff that we've been sharing. And why do we come to Nehemiah? We come to Nehemiah because we remind ourselves that in that book, we celebrate that our God is a God of restoration. And what do we see throughout the scriptures? Throughout the scriptures, we see a God who, who builds walls. We, we see a God who builds cities. We see a God who builds temples. But more than that, we see a God who wants to build lives, who wants to build marriages, who wants to build families, who wants to build relationships. And I wonder if we take up Mike's encouragement and challenge this morning and we apply those words from your prayer and fasting card, I wonder what God might be saying to you this morning, what God might be saying to me this morning about where I need that restorative work of God, that renewing work of God. Because you know what I find amazing? I step back and I remind myself from Genesis right through to Revelation. We read of a, a God who wants to bring cosmic restoration to the whole earth. And yet, he's interested in Scott Pilgrim. He knows my hopes and my dreams and my aspirations but he knows my failings and inadequacies insecurities and he looks at me and he loves me and he cherishes me and he wants the best for me and he has more for me and he invites me into that journey and what's the message of nehemiah it's more than you know, building bricks and building walls. We see a God of restoration, but as we look through the book of Nehemiah, we see that Nehemiah actively cooperates and participates in God's vision for his life and for Israel. There's the need to engage, to participate, the need to say, God, here I am. The older I get, the more I realize that I can't cultivate Christ's likeness in my own life. You know, I can't order godliness and pick it up on Friday. As Jay Adams says, Christ's likeness is not click and collect. Christ's likeness is cultivated as I dare open up my life, warts and all, and say, God, I want to participate with you on the change that you want to bring into my life. And what do we see in Nehemiah? That takes courage, doesn't it? It takes obedience. It takes an openness to say, God, I want you to do that new thing in my life. And so if we come to the book of Nehemiah today, and I'm not going to read a particular passage to you this morning, because when Mike kind of shared the series that you're moving through, uh, there, were, there were Bible verses for me to look at in five chapters of Scripture. How about that? We're going we're to journey through five chapters this morning. I'm going to take a, a big flyover, so don't worry in terms of time. Although I do note in Nehemiah 9, the people came together for six hours as, as a gathering. You want your coffee before that. I've got to get to Enfields. So we're going to take a, we're going to take a flyover. The wall has been built, but take hold of this. So I think it's really important. The wall has been built, 
But that is just one project that God wants to achieve. There is more to do. And God wants to be at work in my life, piece by piece, day by day, bringing those changes. And so if you fly over these chapters, and I want to encourage you to go home this week over a coffee, you might want to read Nehemiah 8 through 12. If you're a to-do list person, you'll love these chapters of Scripture. If you like long lists of unusual names, you'll love these five chapters of Scripture. But as we weave through what might be at times passages, we think, what could God be saying here? Can I suggest to you we see four sacred principles that we can take hold of today? Four sacred principles. Uh, you know, if we're, we're in the renovation game and you're watching, you know, Reno Inc. or Flip It or The Block, there are some things that have to go and there are some things that have to stay. You know, you, you see them walk into the old bathroom and they think, you know, the pink bath has got to go. You know, and the wallpaper's got to come off and the fibro walls have got to go. Some things have got to go, but of course, some foundations have to stay. In Nehemiah chapter 9, we see that some things have to go. We read that the Israelite people separated themselves from the foreigners and they confessed their sins and the sins of their ancestors. And they remained standing in that place for three hours while the book of the Lord was read. And they continued to confess their sins and worship their God. Really quickly this morning, the first sacred principle for us to take hold of again, the sacred principle of confession. When I come before God and I confess my sins, as challenging, as hard as that might be at times, what do I do? I give God space. I, I open the room up afresh. I allow God to be that restoring and renovating God. But of course, that takes courage. And the Israelite people recognized the wall had been built, but God had more for them. And so they come and open their lives and come in confession and repentance. And I'm a visitor here this morning, and I don't know you well, and this can be a challenging space. But I wonder what God might be saying needs to go in your life today. It might be pride. It might be anger. It might be apathy. It might be impurity. We heard about the reality of that today. It might be bitterness that's festering. It might be, as Mike said, something that you know is not right, but it's been hanging around for a long time, a bit like COVID, you know. It might be fear. I wonder today, as we think about a God who loves us and a God who wants to bring restoration and renewal to our lives, am I willing, are we willing to actually open our lives and recognize, of course, we come to the throne of grace and we know a God who forgives and a God who loves and a God who restores. And I wonder whether today might be a liberating day for you today, like it was for Israel, when they come and practice that sacred principle of confession, knowing that God does not seek today to beat us with a stick but he beckons us with love and forgiveness confession has to go but then some things some things have to stay and israel build three foundations in these five chapters of scripture and the first of those is thanksgiving the principle of thanksgiving you know we read in chapter 12 that the wall is dedicated and they came together with joyous celebration. They came to bring thanksgiving to God. They came to share together in thanksgiving of music with cymbals and hearts and lyres. And there's choirs on the walls and there's people celebrating. And we go back into Nehemiah 9 and we read that Israel hasn't partied like this for a long time. Well, it doesn't say partied. It says they came together and they celebrated with joy, with thanksgiving to their God. The reality is that over the last couple of years, we have moved through incredibly challenging and wearisome times, haven't we? I know that as a person in Melbourne. I started in my role at Baptist Mission Australia 
uh, on March the 16th, 2020, with great plans of what my world would look like. And two days later, we closed the office. And then I've been around the world hundreds of times in the last few years on Zoom. And I've been weary and I've been stretched. And, and at times I've been a little bit, come on, God. And I'm sure we've all been in those zones. And then I come back to this scripture and other scriptures and I remind myself that, you know, it's a cliche, but it's not. It's truth. It's in the Bible. It's scriptural. How do I cultivate that gratitude attitude? How do I cultivate an attitude of thanksgiving? How do I stop today and remind myself to stop looking at my circumstances and the things that I don't like or the things that I wish were different? How do I look at my life and step back and say, thank you, God for everything that I have in my world today. Thank you for Clovey. Thank you for my family. Thank you for my neighbors. Thank you for the fact that the under-12 Whitehorse Mustangs coached by me won their semi-final yesterday and beat the team that was previously undefeated. You know, it's not about winning, of course, you know. How do we look at our lives today with an attitude of gratitude? How do we join the Israelites of old and recognize that as we are thankful We allow God to keep building. When we are ungrateful or cynical or in the midst of bitterness or self-pity, we actually close the door to what God can do in our lives. But gratitude opens the door wide and says, God, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I want you to do more and more in my life and my world. And how do we practice that creatively? How do we do that as a church community? How do we do that online? You might online today be chatting now and just wanting to say thank you to God for things in this church community. How do we do it around our dinner table, in our life group? In our life group, we've got a WhatsApp group and people share pictures and stories and prayer points and thanksgiving. How do we do it around the table? We sit with our kids every night when I'm at home and we kind of go around the world, we call it, and the kids talk about things they can be thankful for in their lives. The sacred principle of confession. David says, I was stuck. I was, I, was, I was broken. I was tangled up in sin. And then Psalm 32, blessed is he whose sins are forgiven. David makes space for God to build. And then throughout the Psalms, we see David celebrating with thanksgiving. The sacred principle of confession, the sacred principle of thanksgiving. A third one this morning. We read that Israel came together to rededicate themselves to the way of the Lord, to rededicate themselves to God. In fact, they all came together, and you can see they even signed their names in the, uh, in the chapter. We get a whole long list of people who come together, and we have this picture of like Mike as your lead pastor and all the Clovercrest community standing, and Mike begins to read the Scriptures, and he reads and he reads and he reads for more than half a day, and you stand there together, and then you sign your name and you say, we're in on this. You know what? One of the best lines in this whole section of Scripture comes in Nehemiah 8, chapter, chapter 8, sorry, verse 1, where they say, all the people assembled with a unified purpose. Isn't that good? You've got a unified vision here, a unified purpose. But what does it mean for Scott Pilgrim to align myself each day around the things of God? The sacred principle, I'm going to call it Alignment. You see, I know every day the world beckons me to go in so many different directions. And I can easily be seduced by the culture, the call of materialism, the call of consumerism, the, the call of hedonism, the, uh, the call of the evil one to kind of step away from truth, uh, the, the challenge of, of just the pressures of life today, you know, doing family um, and, and, and the challenges and pressures that have come from the pandemic are the personal issues that you are being challenged by in your life today. Information overload, social media, the labels that other people stick on us, the labels we put on ourselves. And in the midst of that, the call of God to come back to his ways, to the words and the works and the ways of Jesus. And I don't know about you, 
but I have learnt that I can't do that myself. I'm an Australian male who likes to do things and succeed. But I cannot manufacture Christ's likeness on my own. I, I cannot wave a magic wand or press a button. I saw online the other day that in Japan now you can press a button and a steak comes out cooked. Imagine how good that steak is. I'd like it medium rare and you press a button and bing, there it is. That's the world we live in. The world of immediacy. The world that wants things yesterday. You know, my kids want it two weeks ago. You know? My 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 nine year old girl now says, Dad, we never need to go to the shops because we've got Amazon, Dad. You just press the button and it's there tomorrow. And some of us today think that some of us today are trapped in thinking that's how we can become more like Jesus. But we see Israel recognize the need to come afresh around God's word, to come afresh together with a united purpose, with courage, with obedience, with with dedication, and they consecrate themselves. And the only way that I can do that, I've realized, is every day to pray, come Holy Spirit. Those three words have become the most powerful prayer in my life. Uh, when I'm in the midst of a situation where I feel pulled and torn, come Holy Spirit. When I sense temptation in my life, come Holy Spirit. When I'm about to walk into a difficult meeting, come Holy Spirit. When I'm about to get up and speak in a church, come Holy Spirit. But more than that, just with my family as a, as a husband, you know, I, I, I've not arrived. I'm not a perfect uh, husband or a perfect father. And often when I say that and Megan's in the front row, she would say, Amen. But how do I grow as a father? How do I grow as a pastor? How do I grow as a leader? How, how do I grow as a dad? It's around alignment. How do I reorient my life every day around the things of Jesus? And how do I pray, come Holy Spirit? And maybe today you've been in Clovercrest for a long time. You might be watching online somewhere around Adelaide or around the world. And you know that you're off track. You know that you need realignment. You know that you've kind of lost your way. And maybe today is a day to come back to a restoring, renewing God and say, I want to dedicate my life afresh to the ways of Jesus. I've sold out in other dreams and I want to be a citizen of the King. And I want my ethics and my values and my priorities and my goals and my day-to-day activities to look more and more like Jesus. The sacred principle of confession. Some things have got to go in the rebuilding work. What might need to go in our life today? What might we need to let go of? The sacred principle of, of gratitude. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you. The sacred principle of alignment. Come, Holy Spirit, that my life might be aligned to the things of God. We see that in these beautiful, challenging passages in Nehemiah. And then finally, at the beginning of chapter 8, we see it in chapter 9, we see it in chapter 11, we see it in chapter 12. We see the Israelites came together. Then Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people chanted, Amen, Amen, as they lifted their hands and they fell down in worship as they praised their God. What's the final brick in our foundation this morning? The sacred principle of confession, of thanksgiving, of alignment. And then can I suggest to you, it's praise. It's praise. What do I mean by that? We, we, we arrived here at Clovey today and we came in together as an assembly, as a gathered group, and we were led so beautifully in worship. Thank you. Uh, a real sense of hold, the Holy Spirit moving. And we come in worship, and that is a great thing to do. But what about when we walk out these doors and we go home this afternoon and uh, you know the kids are fighting and we've lost the cat and we, we, you know, life is just challenging? Or when we go to work tomorrow, or we turn on our television screens and we hear more about the pandemic, or the heartbreak of Ukraine, or as we're on the mountaintop with so much joy in our lives. What does it mean to posture ourselves to live as a people of praise? That's what we see in this passage. 
Israel so often forgot that. Israel so often became grumpy. Israel so often became disobedient. Israel so often looked at their circumstances rather than their creator. And I've learned in my life, unless I keep looking at the creator day by day by day, then I get hooked on circumstance and created things. But what does it mean for me to stand back and adopt a posture of praise? Last year, I found myself at, uh, at uh, the doctors on a number of occasions. My wife's a nurse. And I was having regular kind of headaches. And then I started to get kind of spasms and pins and needles in my, in my body. And, of course, Megan's telling me, get to the doctors. And I'm an Australian male and I'm busy. And I say, oh, you know, I'll get there eventually. And I finally do. And it's 4 o'clock and I see the doctor and she does a few tests. And by 6 o'clock that evening, two hours later, I'm at uh, Box Hill Imaging having a brain scan. It was a pretty challenging kind of day. The doctor said to me, it could be that you have a brain tumour. And you know, you kind of step back. And I've never been a person to Google health conditions, but I did that day and it wasn't a very good idea. And there I find myself at the X-ray imaging place. And uh, I've kind of, you know, if you've had... Uh, one of those brain scans and the MRI, your, your head gets locked in a little chamber. And uh, they kind of scan you, they push you into the, you know, the chamber. And this young uh, technologist said, um, what, do you want some music? And I said, yeah, play whatever you want. I think she was playing the hits of the late 1990s, early 2000s. And I, I'm, I'm in, the, in the chamber and my mind is trying to kind of think about the Lord as my shepherd while drops of Jupiter is playing in my mind. I got to song three and they've got to change their hit list because you're having a brain scan and song three is when I'm gone. And in that moment, in that moment, your, your mind is racing a million miles an hour and you, you all know that not just having a brain scan we all know when our, our mind is racing and our heart is beating and life seems full and hard I was struck by the fact that I had three choices right then I could panic I could panic and there are some people I sense in the auditorium today or online who are panicking in the midst of challenges, in the midst of what life is throwing at you. You've pressed the panic button. I know, I know what that's like. You press the panic button and you're kind of on the carousel and you're not quite sure how to get off. I'm lying there and I'm thinking I could panic or I could choose pity. And I think one of the greatest diseases in the Western church today is followers of Jesus living with self-pity. We've become so obsessed by circumstance that we forget the creator God who wants to lead us through the valley. God never leads us into a valley. God leads us through valleys. I could have chose pity. And then I'm reciting the Lord as my shepherd's I have all that I need. I have all that I need as the brain scan is continuing. And I say to myself, Scott, you can choose panic or you can choose pity or you can choose praise. Right now, in the midst of whatever is going to happen in my life, do I believe God that much? Is Christ enough that I will praise him in the midst of this situation? The tests are done and I find I haven't got a brain tumor. And I'm thankful for that, but I, I do have a degenerative spinal condition that brings pain into my life every day now. And I'm on really strong medications and I'm trying to get my head around what is it like to live uh, in the midst of pain. And what I've found is that the best thing I can do every day is adopt a posture of praise. That my God is worthy. That my God is good that my God has a plan and purpose for my life as he does for yours and better still that my God is a restoring God that, that my God that your God today 
builds walls. He builds temples. He builds cities. He builds church communities. But more than that, he wants to rebuild and restore my life and yours. And your senior pastor today has invited you that this year might be a year of going deep, a year of restoration. You know, Clovey Baptist Church is the sum of everyone in this building, everyone online today. And the health of this church and the vision of this church, as much as determined by leadership, is determined by how much every one of us want God to bring restoration to our lives, renewal to our lives. And so we saw the card on the, the, the seat there today. And it simply says, what is God saying? Maybe today it's confession. Maybe today it's gratitude. Maybe today it's alignment. Or maybe today it's, I'll raise a hallelujah in the midst of whatever challenge I face in life today. Will you pray with me? Father God, you are a restoring God. And we say thank you. I say thank you that at the darkest, most challenging times in my life, and I look at multiple seasons where life has seemed hard, you're always the God who gets me through. And more than that, I recognize at times when I have felt broken, you are the God who restores and renews because you have a redemptive vision for my life. And you have that for everyone sitting in this building today and for those watching online because you are the God who makes all things new. As we conclude today, I just have that sense that there are some of us in the auditorium or online today who recognize that we need God to do something new in our lives. It might be letting go of stuff, confession. It might be an attitude change. It might be that, God, I'm trying so hard in my marriage, but I can't do it on my own. It might be, God, I've gone off track and I've taken a detour and I want to get back in alignment with you today. It might be, God, just, I need you. Or it might be, God, take my eyes off my circumstances because I want to praise you afresh. God, I need you, the restoring God, the rebuilding God, the loving God, the gracious God, the forgiving God. So right where we are as we conclude our service today, with our eyes closed, our heads bowed, I'm just going to invite you to simply stand. If today you say, God, I need restoration and renewal in my life, can I invite you right now where you are in the auditorium, have courage, just stand and say, God, bring restoration and renewal to my lives. God bless you as people stand across the auditorium. Make it a day of just rededication, a day of renewal. That God, I need the restoring God at work in my life. You can do that online as well. You might even want to message that online or talk to someone after the service. But as people stand across the auditorium, we remind ourselves that God is not finished with us yet. And even more so that God has a beautiful, grand future for Clovercrest Baptist Church, for Clovey. But it begins with each one of us as we open our lives afresh to God. As we say, come, restoring God, come, renewing God. Let's praise Him together and worship Clovey. Let's stand and proclaim the truth.
Church, let's put our hands together. Let's praise the Lord today. Let's just lift up a praise. To, let's lift up a praise to God. We just praise you, Lord. Oh, we praise you. We thank you, Lord, for the work that you're doing in our lives today. We thank you, Lord, for what you are drawing us closer to. Lord, I pray that you will grow us as a people of confession, a people of thanksgiving, a people who are aligned to your will and purposes, and a people of praise. Lord, we see it in the story of Nehemiah. And Lord, may it be true of us today because you are a faithful God and you to be trusted. We love you, Lord. So Lord, as we go into this week, Lord, lead us, guide us. Continue to illuminate the things that you have for us personally, for our families and as a church. And Lord, may we go beyond just asking what you're saying, but may we also... Lord, ask, what are you asking us to do about it? Give us that obedience, Lord, to walk in your will and your ways. We bless you, Lord, in your name. Amen. Amen. If uh, there's been something today that you would love some prayer for, then we'll be down the front. We'd love to pray uh, with you. Uh, I also ask if what you wrote on your card today, uh, if you wouldn't mind, please, giving it to the team on the way out because we'd love to collate together what is the Lord saying across the life of the church. And uh, online, the team are going to capture it there. But if you wouldn't mind just popping that in, uh, one of the team out here, so that we can put together what is the Lord saying to us as a church during the season. Go well. God bless.